So now we'll start an our discussion on analytical dynamics. And as I go into analytical dynamics, I don't know if you can see me here, I'm waving my arms, but uh, if this is the class, I'm drawing a control volume around the class, or I guess I could draw it here. If this is the class, there's a couple things that I want out of the class. Well, I guess the more I think about it, there's a lot. Kinematics in 3D. Uh, hopefully you're feeling like you've seen enough 3D kinematics for a lifetime there. There's Newton Euler. And I'm gonna put check next to that as well, although we are in the midst of practicing that. So we always have to do kinematics. With Newton Euler, we now have a way to write the equations of motion really for any problem. That, this is a complete description of the understanding of the type of problems that we've selected to do. Remember, those are the ones with speeds that are not approaching speed of light, masses that are you know, tangible, uh, and the like. So we've done that. Now there are a few other things I wanna do, which is an alternative way to look at the dynamic world. And that's what we're doing now, analytical dynamics. I'm gonna show you an alternative approach, or really it's a class of approaches to do these same problems. These are powerful because it gives you an, you know, uh, 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 an alternative method. Same result, but an alternative method. When we complete that, there are two other things that I wanna do in this class. Well, really one other thing, and that is we've got these equations of motion, what do we do with them? So we have to assess them. We have to uh, evaluate the equations of motion. Uh, we need some way to do that. We, we spent a little time talking about closed form solutions. We spent a little time talking about phase portraits. And then uh, the primary workhorse that we have though will be numerical integration. And I want to spend time in this class doing that. So as we're, you know, as our weeks are rapidly running along, we've got two big things we still need to do. Analytical dynamics and then evaluating equations of motion through numerical integration. On the website, I have now uh, really the, the big overview on the analytical dynamics techniques. Uh, I haven't extended it really to rigid bodies, and I'll be adding those notes, and we'll do that together. But here are the things that we're going to do. This is a nice outline. So when you come into analog, analytical dynamics, the whole concept is now you're greatly, you're opened up to how you can look at the coordinate systems that you're gonna describe. And we call these things generalized coordinates. It's a set of coordinates that are very gen, that are general. Uh, they simply have to describe the system. They're significant in that the generalized coordinates uh, are posed as a vector called Q, but it's, the vector Q is composed of a whole series of scalars. So those coordinates can be scalars. They don't have to be vectors. Uh, I have two things to talk about constraints, holonomic and non-holonomic constraints. I'm gonna let you watch those videos really to get some of the nuances in that. Then the starting point for analytical dynamics is virtual work. That's what we'll start off with. I've got three notes on virtual work here that you can watch. A definition of virtual work, slightly formal, uh, virtual work for system particles and then static equilibrium. The second tool is D'Alembert's principle. We've already seen virtual, you've already talked about virtual work some, so I'll try to summarize that. Virtual work by itself though only applies to static equilibrium. D'Alembert's principle extends virtual work to dynamics. It's straightforward. When we end with D'Alembert's principle though, we, we still have, we now have uh, a work-based, an energy-based approach but it's still described in terms of vectors. You're still writing everything in terms of forces and accelerations, both of which are vectors. Lagrange's equations, which would be the prototypical, the primary analytical technique that we currently use, although there are many, uh, Lagrange's equations takes virtual work and D'Alembert's principle and extends these now to an energy-based description of dynamics that is based on a generalized force, not a, not a vector force, but a generalized force and energy contained in the system. So it relaxes both the constraints on um, vectors, on a fixed set of coordinates, and then uh, uh, you know, an energy-based approach. 
So to start with, so let's march through. So we talked about generalized coordinates. Again, I want you to watch, watch that, but when you think about generalized coordinates, we're gonna to refer to our generalized coordinates with some, as some Q, a vector of Q, and that Q is gonna contain components Q1, Q2, Q3, all the way up to Qn. So the idea here is we have N generalized coordinates. And those coordinates really, frankly, can be anything. These Q can be anything, or Q sub I can be anything that describes your system. You now, the obvious ones that we might say is, well, let's just let Q be our components we used before. So Q could be like your X, you know, it could be X, Y, Z but it could be other things. It could be, um, gosh, it could be anything. It could be, um, uh, it really could be anything that would describe your system. You might think of it, Q, as polar coordinates, you know, like R's and thetas. Uh, you could use other coordinate systems. It could be, I've heard people talk about components in a Fourier transform, uh, uh, density, power density functions, the like anything that contains information about your system you can use. Now I tend to deal with uh, dimensional motion based dimensional coordinates personally, things that generally have units of radians or meters. But as long as this coordinate system, as long as these parameters span the description of your system, that's valid. And then take a look at our discussion on the constraints. Uh, go ahead and watch that. I think it's pretty straightforward to you, but watch that discussion on the constraints. And I try to add a little discussion on this tricky concept of non-holonomic constraints there. I'm not going to talk about that now, but I try to provide a couple hands-on examples in that set of notes that tell you how to uh, understand, well, how to identify holonomic constraints sort of how to identify non holonomic constraints and definitely how to get an intuitive understanding for that idea of non holonomic constraints. Now, as we go forward, our early work will assume, our early work's gonna assume holonomic constraints. <clears throat> Later on, we'll come back and talk about how we include those more pesky non holonomic constraints. Oh, and just, just so you're, sitting there saying, well, what is this? Remember, holonomic constraints are constraints that you can write in, uh, in displacement form or in position form. I can write these in position or in terms of the cues, in terms of cues and time only. It's a time there. That's the idea of the holonomic constraint. So if I had you know, two particles that are separated by a rigid L, so that's a M1 and M2, L is fixed length. That's a constraint. And that constraint can be written in terms of, you know, the coordinates of each end. They gotta be some fixed distance apart. I can write that just in terms of the cues. Uh, that's the idea of the holonomic constraint. And the prototypical non-holonomic constraint, holonomic constraint is the uh, wheel rolling on the ground. So with this, with this concept of generalized coordinates, I can now, well, actually, <clears throat> that's one thought. One thought is generalized coordinates. Okay, so that's one thought. I know that was brief, but hopefully you've kind of got it in your mind because I've been referring to coordinates as Q and being somewhat general along. The second thought, is now virtual work, and we're familiar with that. The idea of virtual work is, first of all, that I've got this thing called virtual work. It's a virtual operator. It's applied to work. Work, of course, is energy. It's a form of energy. And I say that my virtual work is defined as the force, the force acting on my system dotted with the virtual displacement. To get specific, if I've got multiple particles, I'm gonna sum the forces on all the particles dotted with displacement, the virtual displacement of all the particles over all the particles for I equal one to cap n. So that's the virtual work of my system. Again, the concept of this virtual is that it occurs, it's like a differential except it occurs in 
instantaneously. I.e., time the displacement occurs in a in a idea of a fixed time, or you know time independent. It is clearly just a, a conceptual thing in that, you know, I can't be at two locations at one point in time, but the idea of a virtual displacement is a displacement that occurs over an instant, instant, instant period of time. It is actually very useful in kinematics because the concept of the virtual displacement is that it describes specifically how that thing could move at that instant in time. So the second thought is this idea of virtual work and what's the big deal? Well, remember the big deal, you guys saw that already, is that when I dot my force with displacement, when I dot my force with the virtual displacement, the constraint forces disappear. Constraint forces disappear. In other words, my constraint forces dotted with my virtual displacements go to zero. And uh, we talked about that, you read about that in chapter three in the book, and I've got a little note, another quasi proof or a quasi thing to show that. So the second thought is I can write my virtual work in any time. And the nice thing about the virtual work, I can clearly describe the energy or the work in the system by simply dotting the active or the external forces with the virtual displacement. The, uh, an aside on this is that if the system is in equilibrium, which I guess is what we assume, then the virtual work has to equal zero. So that's true for systems in equilibrium. So this gives me uh, an equation that is now useful that I can see I can start solving problems with. The virtual work is, which is the sum of, you know, the forces on all the bodies dotted with the virtual displacements of all the bodies. So I just add up the work of the whole system. If my system is in equilibrium, that sum has to be equal zero and the constraint forces disappear. So these are just the external forces on the system. I can combine the first and second thought, or I can combine this concept of generalized coordinates and the concept of virtual work. And I'll do that by noting that my um, virtual displacement R sub I can be written as the, as basically this, you know, I can take the partial of R, of my R with respect to all my Q's. So, so my R I can be written as a function of my Q's, Q1, Q2, Q3 all the way up to Qn. So that means the virtual R, the variation in R, can be the, ver can be the partial of R with respect to each of the terms. I'm just gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna drop this I for the moment. We'll just assume it's some general R. So the variation in R, which gives me a virtual R, can be the variation, can be the partial of R with respect to each of my terms. So the partial of Q1 times then the variation in Q1 plus the partial of R with respect to Q2 times the variation in Q2, and I can just keep on doing that. Or I can rewrite this as the sum, and it looks like I've already used I, so I'll say J equal one to little n of the partial of my R with respect to Q, J, times the virtual QJ. So I can write my displacement in terms of my generalized coordinates using this relationship. And that allows me to write my virtual work in terms of the generalized coordinates. So the virtual work, the total virtual work on the system is the sum for I equal one to capital N of my F sub I dotted with the 
virtual displacement, right? But now I'm going to replace that out with my virtual displacement written in terms of my generalized coordinates. So it's going to be the dotted with the sum for j equal one, so little n partial of r. Now it is r sub i with respect to q sub j times virtual q sub j. And if a system is equilibrium, that equals zero. And I will now rewrite this. I'll note that uh, I'll bring my sum of f sub i, I'll bring that into the summation. I'll bring the uh, q sub j out of the summation. So I'm going to swap the order of the summations. So I'm going to then have my virtual work equals the sum of j equal 1 to little n. I'll do that on the outside times my q sub j. And on the inside, I'll bring my sum over all the particles, so sum from i equal 1 to cap n f sub i dotted with the partial of r sub i with respect to qj. And again, for equilibrium, I can say that equals 0. So this gives me a statement. This is my virtual work statement. This is my virtual work with generalized coordinates. Projecting ahead, this term inside here, notice that I've got, here I've got my displacement, but it's the partial of my displacements with respect to my generalized coordinates. And here I have a displacement. This is the virtual displacement of my generalized coordinates. So if I look at, if I take this term and call this thing my cap QJ, which I'm going to call my generalized force, I'll dot that with my generalized displacement, my generalized virtual displacement and I'll sum over all of my generalized coordinates. That'll give me a new way of writing my virtual work, okay? So I'm writing it as a generalized force dotted with a virtual displacement of one of my generalized terms, my generalized displacement terms. Generalized coordinate. And that equals zero. Notice, Uh, let's notice something here. Previously, we wrote this thing above. Notice that above, we wrote this. Let me scroll back up to when we wrote it previously. Previously, we wrote it this way. Okay. Previously, this is how we wrote this thing. It was a, a vector force and then a vector displacement. See the vector signs? Down here, we've written it in terms of a generalized force, but it's not a vector, right? It's not a vector. This thing's not a vector, right? It's the result of a dot product. It's the result of the scalar product. We call it a scalar product. So that's a scalar. See that? Scalar. And that scalar is dotted with another thing, and that's also not a vector. That's a scalar. That's one of the components of my generalized force, okay? Or excuse me, my generalized coordinates. So this is the first step in analytical dynamics. I've gone from vec a vector product now to the scalar, the scalar thing. And I should have dropped this dot. That's just multiplied, not a dot. My bad there. All right, so this is uh, the statement of virtual work, but now in terms of generalized coordinates, and I've taken a step forward. I could, as an aside, I can note that um, if my generalized coordinates are independent, so now I've written the vector of Q, the vector Q, right, which just consists of the components little q, the little components of q, which would be like q1, q2, 
that if my generalized coordinate is, if my generalized coordinates are independent, okay, if my generalized coordinates are independent, then I can rewrite this equation. Let's look and see what happens if these are independent. Look, I'm summing over j, j equal one to n. So that means, you know, cap q sub one times the variation in q little q sub one. This, this probably doesn't hurt to take a minute and write this out. So what does that mean? That means like cap q sub one times little variation in q one plus cap q sub two times little variation in q two plus cap q sub three times little variation in q three and so on all the way out to cap Q n times little variation in Q sub n has to equal zero. That sum has to equal zero, right? Now, if my, if my Qs are independent, if the which means these variations of my Qs are independent, then these things could be anything. They're a variation, right? If they're independent, they could be anything. And presumably, I could choose not zero as something, right? So they could be anything. So my delta Q sub J's could be anything. And not zero. I mean, they could be zero, right? But they could also not be zero. Good with that? So based on that, under what circumstance would this equation hold? And somebody fire off on the chat. I'm going to give you a second here. Somebody fire off in the chat. Under which circumstance would this whole thing then be zero? If my little, if my variation in Q sub J's could be anything, then what does that say about this equation? And I'm looking for a comment in the chat. Equal and opposing. All right, excellent. Equal and opposing. Yep. Good, I like it, I like it. Okay, so I'm gonna roll with that one. Equal and opposing, I agree. And so, um, and furthermore, not only just equal, right? But if this thing equals zero, and this guy is not zero, and it's independent of those, then the only way this thing can be zero is if this thing is zero, and this thing is zero. So the Q's have to be equal and opposing, and furthermore, Q sub one has to equal Q sub two, all the way out and out, and they all have to equal zero. So <clears throat> this statement of virtual work can be used to tell me that, um, can be used to solve for these cap, um, you know, for my cap Qs, and then stepping back to my forces uh, in the case of equilibrium. All right, comments on that, questions, thoughts? probably catching up to me so I'll pause a minute if you have a thought share it otherwise we'll pause for a moment and then do a quick example Ready, ready to start an example? All right, I'm starting the example. Please type in a chat real quick if you need me to slow down or repeat something. I'm trying to watch the chat here. Let's do a little example. Um, by the way, all of this was on those little segments of notes, probably a little more focused. Uh, this example is not. So this example is new information. On this example, uh, I've got you know two walls, and I've leaned a ladder up against the walls, and this ladder has uh, some kind of block here. I don't know if it's a ladder, but it's got some block there of M1. Got some block here of M2. No friction, 
this ladder is length L and it's massless. And um, I'm going to apply some load P here. And we'll say that's some angle theta. You know, I don't, <clears throat> you know, I prefer to measure the angle from the horizontal over, but we'll just call that theta. So let's, in this case, uh, with virtual work, we yet don't have dynamics. So let's look at this as a, a non-dynamic problem. Let's look at it as a static problem. And the question is, what value of P would keep this uh, ladder, keep this ladder with these masses at either end stationary or in equilibrium? And again, no friction in my little example here. You could add friction, but I don't have any. So to show the method, let's very quickly think about how we do it, you know, the, uh, you know, our Newton way, the Newton way, which is a fine way. The Newton way. Well, the Newton way would be to, uh, I've got two, you know, initially I've got two bodies. They do have a constraint, but I've got two bodies with two motions. So my Newton way would be to draw two free body diagrams. So it'd be like an FBD1, uh, an FBD2. Write the forces. So it looks like I'm going to get a M1G. Let's call this uh, cap N1. That's the force of my reaction force on that guy in that direction, and then I've got to get some <clears throat> tension in the ladder. You know what, I'm gonna change my angle. Eh, I know you hate it when I do this, sorry. Let's change that data. <coughs> or leave it. I think it's fine either way. Going into my free body diagram two, in this case, I'm gonna assume that T is going the opposite way, the same T, but it's opposite now. I get an M1G, I get some N2 acting up on it, and I get a P. I would write my equations. My equations are Newton's second law. These are particles, so I don't have to worry about uh, moments. So I'd get N, you know, the sum of forces in the X. So it'd be like N1 plus T times the cosine of theta equals mass times acceleration, M1 times acceleration, but there's no acceleration, so it's zero. I get some force in the Y, that would be a minus M1G plus T sine theta equals zero. On this guy, jump to the other one, some force in the X, I'm gonna get minus P, and now I get a minus T cos theta, that's equal zero. Some force in the Y, I get minus T sine theta plus N2 minus M2G equals zero. See that should have been an M2G there. <coughs> and then I would solve for my unknowns. What are my unknowns? Uh, I don't know N1, I don't know T, I don't know P, I don't know N2. So I got four unknowns. Four equations, four nodes. And that's what I would say. That's the Newton way. <coughs> Let's try it the, um, the virtual work way. I almost want to say the virtual way. So in the way of virtual work, uh, I would write that the virtual work on my system, which is the sum over my particles for I equal one cap N times N, uh, let's try, okay, I'm uh, going off my example a little bit. Let's try doing it the way we just saw. So, uh, 
uh, hopefully I don't get hung up on this. I want to try it the way we just saw. So it'd be the sum for little j equal one to little n sum over my particles, i equal one to cap n. So of f, oops. It's I equal one cap n F sub i dotted with partial of R sub i with respect to Q j times uh, variation in Q j equals zero. <clears throat> so this is the virtual way. So we've got in this case, uh, our cap n equals two, right? We've got mass one and two. And our number of generalized coordinates, so now we need to ask ourselves how many generalized coordinates? And I'm wondering if we can, um, Well, there's just one generalized coordinate, right? Little n is one. There's one generalized coordinate. Because the reason I say that is because there's one degree of freedom. And uh, let's make, let's let in our case, well, Tell you what, guys. Let me do this in two steps. Let's do it first. Um, I'm going to break this in two steps. Let's first look at it without the general, without specifically talking about generalized coordinates. So we'd say we want to sum for i equal one to cap n of f sub i dotted with my variation in r sub i. Let's do this first. Equal, and that's equal zero. So our r sub i, I need to have two of them. So I've got an r sub one and an r sub two. My r sub one, let's just say that this guy is located out here. This is some x and that's some y. So my r sub one <coughs> is gonna be located uh, y, you know, just y, if this is my coordinate frame, right? It's just up here, <coughs> some distance y. And my r sub two is x. <coughs> Then the uh, virtual, oh, and by the way, that, uh, I guess I need directions, don't I? So let's call this my X and that's my N1 direction. And that's my Y, that's my N2 direction. So it'd be Y in the N2 and X in the N1. So there, they're vectors. My virtual of R sub one would be, or the variation R sub one would be just the virtual variation in Y of Y in the N2. And my virtual R2 would be just the variation now in X comes into. So my virtual work now is the sum. So I've got to have the forces acting on body one. The forces acting on body one were the uh, N1 in the uh, little N1 direction. I get the T the moment I'll just leave it that vector T right I get the uh, minus m1g acting in the n2 direction and that's all dotted with my virtual r1 which is the variation of y n2 Dr. Uh, Canfield Yes. R one instead of two. Say that again. And up there, the F, or the R two. Yep. Oh, thanks, Kevin. That was Kevin. Okay. Correction right here. Kevin pointed out. I think that's what you're saying. My sum of forces on the, uh, or excuse me, the forces 
the virtual work associated with the second body, which I have to add in, that's the forces on these guys. So it's going to be a minus vector T, which I need to put into X and Y components. Uh, minus P, that one is in the N1 direction. Uh, minus M2G in the N2 plus capital N2 in the little n2 direction. And I dot this with, thank goodness, Kevin caught us, partial of x respect to n1. And that all has to equal zero. We'll write this one more time. Uh, notice that my t is going to become um, t cos theta in the N1 and uh, plus T sine theta in the N2. So the first equation, you know, this, this term cancels, this term cancels, and I just have these two things. So I get T sine theta minus M1G times my virtual Y. My second equation, this T is again T cos theta N1, T sine theta N2, but they're negative. It's all dotted with the N1. So the second equation, I'm going to get the minus T cos theta minus P. Times my virtual X equals zero. Pose with the same problem as before. Okay, so I've written this out now. Remember, I said above for these things to be independent. As long as my displacements are independent, these terms would be have to be zero. But this is kind of a special case. This virtual x and virtual y are not independent. So I probably should have just written it the other way. Note that uh, virtual x and virtual y are not independent. You know, if they were, I would set those terms equal to each other. So I can write, I can write them out. I can write a relationship on them. And the relationship here is that the distance, you know, this distance is L, this distance is X, this distance is Y. So I can write a relationship to X squared plus Y squared equals L squared. And if I take the variation in that constraint, which is this thing, I'll get 2x times the variation in x plus 2y in the, times the variation of y equals the variation in L, that's constant, so that's equal to zero. Or I can write that my virtual x equals my minus virtual y minus y virtual y over x and I've canceled my two. And since I have that angle theta, I've got this angle theta here. Um, I'm going to rewrite this one more. I've got this relationship. Let me go back. Um, well, yeah, sorry. I'm going to just put that back down. So that's negative y virtual y over x. My y, if I want to write it in terms of my theta, my y is L cos theta. My x is L, no, my y is L sine theta. My x is L cos theta. 
in this case, because I'm going out, I need a negative sign. So if I plug those in, they give me a virtual X equals uh, negative L sine theta virtual Y over negative L cos theta, which is just a tangent of theta. So if I just wanted to write this in terms of my theta. Probably I could have gotten there more quickly another way. That t theta, that's tangent theta. So uh, if I go back and plug that back in above, I'm, I can get uh, t sine theta minus m1g. Times virtual y plus minus t cos theta minus p times the tangent of theta virtual y, which is sine theta over cos theta equals zero, or t sine theta minus m1g minus. T sine theta, you know, cosine theta is cancel, minus P sine theta over cos theta, all times virtual Y equals zero. That means this thing has to equal zero. So my T sine theta is cancel, and I get P equals negative M1G cosine theta over sine theta. So I've done that right. Probably, uh, okay. Com questions on this problem? Uh, you know, I'm smiling to myself. I guess I'm not trying to make it look easier than the other method. Uh, what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show a couple things. One is we didn't solve it using Newton's method, but if we did, we could show that we get the same answer, number one. Number two, you see this constraint T here? This constraint disappeared. I could have actually eliminated, well, actually, what were the constraints in the equation? The constraints were uh, N1, N2, and T. Those three were constraints. And when we wrote the virtual uh, work, they all disappeared. So frankly, I could have gone straight ahead to the terms that cause work in this, and it is just the P. So I could have just written it directly with the P. The virtual work eliminated those from my problem because they're not contributing work to the system. Finally, I probably, you know, I started off writing it in terms of the virtual displacements. And uh, I started off up here. That might have made it even a little, well, it have been an alternative if I would have said that my R, if my generalized coordinates were Q, if I would have written it, say, just in theta or X or Y, I could have chosen any one, I could have chosen theta, X or Y, then if I would have chosen theta, then I would have found R1 as a function of theta would have been, um, we just said negative L cos theta, and R2 would have been positive L sine theta, the Partial of R with respect to R1 with respect to Q would have been positive L sine theta. Partial of R with respect to Q2 would have been positive L cos theta. And you could have worked that one out and gotten kind of the same, sort of the same process. Okay. Well, that was my virtual work example. Again, showing that you can treat this problem in two ways the virtual work way or the Newton way. The Newton way is going to give us, you know, 
three for a planar problem, three equations for every body, or six equations for every rigid body in space. The virtual work method will give us <clears throat> a number of equations that are equal to the number of degrees of freedom of the system. If we have constraints, depending on how we deal with the constraints, you may have you know, a, an extra step. In this case, I started off with two generalized coordinates, virtual X and virtual Y, or X and Y. So that gave me two, con two equations to begin with, right? Of sorts, well really just one equation, but I had to deal with a second constraint equation. So even in this case, I, I went first to two equations, two unknowns, which I then solved. Okay. So that's virtual work. Next, D'Alembert's principle. By the way, any uh, questions, comments? So Dr. Canfield, this is Kevin. Um, like this is, you know, I write with my right hand pretty well, and, and this is like trying to learn how to write with my left hand, a whole other method for... Yes. There other, is there like future problems that this is going to apply to that... Yeah, good question, um, Kevin. First of all, in this class, we're frankly not going to use virtual work. We're going to use Lagrange, and virtual work is a stepping stone. So immediately, I'm trying to show here the idea that I could solve this problem. You know, this problem here, I'm scrolling over. You, you would, if I would have given you this problem, you'd set it up this way and solve it and wouldn't consider it to be that big of a deal. I'm showing you that this other equation that I've constructed can similarly solve the problem. We're going to use this, though, as a stepping stone going forward. So I guess the quick answer is there will be lots of practice, and the practice will be directly on the dynamics problems that we're going to be solving. Does that help, Kevin? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, good. Be afraid to jump in with more. I don't think that was a strong answer, but good question, Kevin. Keep jumping in, anyone at any time. All right. Uh, the next, yeah, so we are going to practice this stuff a lot. That's the short answer. The next step uh, is D'Alembert's principle. And D'Alembert's principle goes from, you know, uh, it extends virtual work from statics to dynamics. By the way, I'm not pronouncing D'Alembert correctly. Um, it's Lombard or something. I, I can't quite say it right. I'm not French. I guess this fellow was. I'm assuming that's French. I think his name was like John Renault D'Alembert. Anyhow, amazing guy. But if there was somebody that you say, well, actually, I probably could have figured that out. This would be one of those cases. I guess what he did was he looked at Newton's law, F equals MA, that's force. That's an acceleration, and uh, you know that's just the mass. Together, you know these are the, the inertia, and D'Alembert's claim to fame was, well, why not just write it like this? F basis, but that's dynamics. Dynamics hard, statics easy. So why not just write the equation like this? And let's go one step farther. Let's just call that M A an inertial force F O, so we can make it look like. A statics problem. Look, voila, sum of forces where force consists of F plus FO equals zero. And this FO is what we call the inertial, this quote, inertial force. And it equals negative MA. So that's really, as near as I can tell, all there is to the concept of D'Alembert. Now, when D'Alembert's principle, this idea is applies to virtual work, I think the book calls it the generalized principle of D'Alembert. 
And when we do that, uh, we say now that the virtual work of our system is the uh, uh, well, it's just the uh, F sub I, or just sum over bodies, data with the virtual R sub I. Oops. Um, oh, actually, hold on, sorry. F sub I uh, plus the F sub O, that's what I wanted to say. So it's F sub I, this is the external forces or the active forces, and this is the inertial forces dotted with our virtual displacement equals zero or sum over i equal one to cap n f sub i minus m sub i times the uh, r sub i double dot that's how i'm going to write the acceleration dotted with the virtual r sub i equals zero So, uh, you know, that's, that's it. That's basically the idea of uh, D'Alembert or ge generalized principle of D'Alembert. We, uh, we can go a step farther and um, uh, you know, we can go a step farther and write this in terms of uh, in, we can write this in terms of the generalized coordinates. And when we do that, we'll get now the sum over j equal one to little n, okay, because we're going to do this over our generalized coordinates. So here I've written it over the q sub j's. And this whole thing equals zero. That equals zero for the case of uh, equilibrium. And inside here, we're going to sum over all the bodies. So I equal one to cap n. We'll get the F sub I dotted with the partial of R sub I with respect to QJ minus the m sub i r sub i double dot times the partial that should be a partial partial of r sub i with respect to q sub j and uh, dotted with uh, or excuse me then times the Variation in Q sub J equals zero. And again, if our virtual Q sub J's are independent, then uh, this equation, and you know, we could write this as our cap Q sub J. So our equation Q sub J minus Uh, I guess we got to sum over these guys minus the sum of the M sub I R sub I double dot partial of R sub I with respect to QJ I equal one to cap N has to equal zero for all J. So, you know, if we have 
if we have, let's say, little n equals, you know, just as an example, if we've got a three Dolph system, three degrees of freedom, then little n equals three, that would give us q, you know, q sub j would equal q sub one, q sub two, q sub three, and we would get, you know, we get three such equations, three equations, and then three unknowns. So that's the idea of this system. It would be, and, and all the constraints would disappear. Okay, so this is, this is where I'm gonna stop with D'Alembert's principle. So D'Alembert's principle simply added to virtual, the generalized principle of D'Alembert says in virtual work, we had the sum of the F sub i's dotted with the virtual displacements equals zero for D'Alembert, it was the F sub i minus the M sub i R sub i double dot dotted with the virtual displacement equals zero. We can write this in terms of generalized coordinates and if our coordinates are independent, then we'd get a set of these equations. Now, you know, your book does a really nice, this is one of the strengths of the book. The book, uh, traditionally, we would say that these methods, you know, this method was just a stepping stone to Lagrange, and that's the way we're going to treat it here. But frankly, there are people that are not, I mean, there are ways that you can go back and solve. So you could use the generalized principle of D'Alembert by itself to solve problems, or you could use the principal virtual work by itself, the way we construct it to solve problems. Typically, it's a stepping stone, although some people can use them directly. Again, for us, these are stepping stones. So as such, I'm uh, not going to give you homeworks on them to practice. You know, frankly, I don't solve problems using these. Uh, probably most of the software mo modeling software that you might use down the road probably don't use these as much. Uh, they're more stepping stones, but they could be, but they could be used, all right? If we sit back and look at these equations, okay, and we're about to make the next step. Now we're about to make our big step, which is good because I'm watching my time. I need to move up. We're about to move to Lagrange. If we sit back and look at these equations, though, I want to, I would like to say a couple big things. What have we done? First of all, we've written equations uh, in terms of our, uh, uh, well, first, here's what we got. What? have we done? Well, first we've uh, eliminated constraints. So when we write our problems, and you know this from working the, if you've started the homeworks, the practice problems, Newton Euler, typically you get lots of equations, always lots of equations, even if it's a one degree of freedom problem, you're still gonna have six, eight equations, and most of those are gonna be constraints. By going to this energy method, we strip out those constraints from the get-go. You don't even need to write, you don't need to write, you don't need to include the constraints in your problem. Your problem is just interested in parts that do work. D'Alembert extended virtual work to dynamic systems. <clears throat> That's the first thing. The second thing you've done is we've given a little bit of insight toward uh, breaking free of vectors toward non-vectors or things other than vectors. And the insight would be here. See this Q sub J? We talked about that. That's a scalar. This thing is a scalar. Now, at the moment, the way I've written this out, this guy's not a scalar. Look, it's M sub I dotted with R I double dot. That's a that's a vector and that's a vector and there's a dot. So these are vectors, but you can kind of, kind of see that they're headed towards scalars and they're written in terms of the Q sub J. So that's what we've done. And then I need to say one other thing, are there some limitations? You know, I've made the limitations very clear in that little, uh, in the set of notes that I have online, I've tried to make the limitations very clear and I did it in this, uh, I think, the virtual work definition, and I'm going to highlight them here. There are some limitations. I'll list the limitations, but, uh, but to see where they arise, uh, go back and review. These limitations uh, are primarily uh, assume holonomic constraints. <clears throat> 
So we've eliminated the we've eliminated the constraints, but that only works so far if they are holonomic constraints. So that's the primary limitation. All right, now we're going to jump into a Lagrange. And that's the, you know, that is, Lagrange is the uh, second big thing that's coming out of this work. So Lagrange effectively wanted to extend, you know, Lagrange extends the uh, generalized principle of D'Alembert. And he wanted to write it this way. He wanted to say that first term, that sum for i equal one to cap n of the s of i dotted with the partial of r sub i with respect to qj. He wanted to write that term as a generalized force, which I've already been doing. Okay, so that was step one. Write forces as generalized force. Now note, again, we call this thing a force, but it's a generalized force. It's a scalar quantity. It's the dot product of the applied forces dotted with the partial of our displacements or partial of the position with respect to the generalized coordinates. That's the first thing he did. The second thing he did, all right, Kevin, hang on to your hat. Kevin, you got a hat there? Hang on to it. No hat today. Okay, oh, no hat. Oh man, well hang on to your chair then. The second thing that uh, D'Alembert did was this. So what, what are two terms? We got this term, and we got this term. So I've already shown you the general score. And the second thing D'Alembert did was he said, well, this uh, sum over all the particles of m sub i times r sub i, oh, times the acceleration, right? Dotted with the partial of r sub i with respect to qj. He said, let's just write that thing as the partial of t with respect to qj dot. Okay, there's a little more. T, what's that t? t where t is kinetic energy. So he said, write this term, this product of acceleration dotted with these things, write this as the partial of your kinetic energy with respect to qj dot. Uh, take the time derivative of that and subtract the partial of t with respect to qj. So he rewrote this first term in terms of generalized forces <clears throat> and the second term as basically a derivative of the energy of the kinetic energy. <clears throat> and then, you know, once you have that, he simply said uh, that the, he said that my, my equations of motion now, LeBron said my equations of motion can now be rewritten as the DDT or the partial T with respect to QJ dot minus the partial T with respect to QJ <coughs> equals this cap QJ. And uh, he said, these are my equations of motion. So everyone else calls them Lagrange's equations. All right, T is kinetic energy, Q is a generalized force, they're scalars, you do this for all J. So, you know, for J equal basically one to your number of degrees of freedom or generalized coordinates. And of course, this assumes QJs are independent. That's pretty wild, right? 
So how can you get away with that? So in the, you know, the 10 minutes I have left, I want to see if we can quickly show how he did this, all right? So we've already seen the first term. We saw that above, the uh, fact that the generalized force is simply defined as the forces dotted with the virtual displacements. Uh, let's look at this second term. So, let's consider these terms. So, first of all, let's see how Lagrange got away with doing this. The T is simply one half M V squared, right? One half M V squared. That's what I want to write. But I don't have a V and it's, a, it's vector quantities, right? So I got to write it as, I'm going to sum over all the particles. It's going to be one half M sub I times R I dot dotted with R I dot. That is R I squared. Okay, so if I have a vector, keep forgetting my vector sign. If I have a vector and I want to square it, that means I just dot it with itself. So we've got to do now two terms. We've got to take the partial of t with respect to qj, and I've got to take the partial of t with respect to qj dot. So let's first take the partial of t with respect, this is our second step, partial of t with respect to qj. Now recall one more time that our r sub i we're assuming is written as a function of q, so it's q1, q2, q3, all the way out, and it could be time. Time could be in there as well. That's my assumption. So I, if I take the partial of r, excuse me, if I want the, um, If I want the derivative of R, Ri dot, I've got to take the, you know, and I want to write it in terms of my generalized coordinates, I'm going to take the partial of R with respect to Q1 times Q1 dot plus the partial of R sub I with respect to Q2 times Q2 dot and so on plus the partial of R with respect to time times T dot, or by DT. You know, the partial of T with respect to T, which is just one. And recall that we said for our, our virtual displacement, in the case of the virtual displacement, time doesn't change. So this whole term will go to zero. So when I take the partial of t with respect to qj, I, get, I do this over the sum for i equal 1 to cap n. I have 1 half m sub i. So first I take the partial of ri with respect to q. Uh, Partial of my, okay, I've got the, yeah. Sorry guys, let me write this, we're gonna do this one more time. I'm gonna rewrite this ri dot as the sum, see I can just take the sum of partial of r, r, respect to qj, I can sum for j equal one to n times qj dot. That's what I'm trying to say. So uh, I just added to the, I just took the sum here. So when I go back up to this equation, I can- Dr. Canfield? Yes. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. No, um, no. There's, a, there's a significant lag in between what you're writing and what you're saying. Um, could you pause just for a second so we can catch up? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hey, Tommy, is it in the, um, okay, yeah, I'm going to pause. Thank you.
Mayfield? Yep. Yep. In R dot I, you're canceling some uh, some values to one and to zero. Would you write those a little yeah. larger again, I guess? Yep. Let me zoom in here. Kind of read what those were. Yeah, I got really sloppy. So let me just go back and clean this up. Uh, so here's my RI. It's just a function of my Qs and time. Now, the whole reason for using this concept of virtual R, which is, remember, it doesn't show up here, but this came from virtual work. So my Rs are all considered in a virtual sense. So what that means is time is held fixed in these problems. However, if I just write R out as a function of Qs in time, then R dot, I'll first take the partial of my R with respect to each of my terms inside here, right? Multiplied by the time derivative of Q. So that's just the, uh, is that the chain rule, I guess? And then out at the end, now this was your question to me. So I keep going through all the rest of the Qs. And then I get to the end. So I get the partial of R with respect to T times the, dt dt right which is that term is one but i'm going to be doing this for a virtual r so in a in the case of a virtual r remember we said that time doesn't change so there's no so my change in R only occurs over these other coordinates. I'm holding time fixed, so that's gonna drive this time, this guy to zero. So that's my justification. So I do have time, I can write my coordinates in terms of time, but when I think about their behavior in a virtual sense, this time is independent, All, it's independent. So my, my partials of R with respect to time go away. Okay, thank you. So that allows me to write, yeah, that allows me to write my, virtu, my time derivative in this way. Okay. All right, so, uh, Okay, so I'm going back, I'm taking the partial of my kinetic energy with respect to QJ. That is um, here, the sum from I equal one to cap N, one half M sub I, so I got that term. Now I'm gonna get first the partial of my R sub I, uh, I get the partial of R sub I with respect to QJ dotted with the R sub I, and I'm forgetting my vector dots, okay? So I get this, plus, so I get the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. And I can note that the, in the dot product, I can switch the order with no loss in generality. So if I switch the order on this guy, I, I see I just get this term twice, okay? So I can rewrite the partial of T with respect to QJ as the sum for I equals one to cap N. I'm gonna write this one twice, that'll cancel out my one half. So I can write it as M sub I times the partial of my R sub I dot with respect to qj dotted with r sub i vector dot. So that's the first term I need. I guess I spent a lot of time doing it, doing that. 
I don't know that we needed that much effort, but I get that. The third thing I'm gonna do is take the partial of T with respect to QJ dot. Okay, up here in Lagrange, I had first the partial of T with respect to QJ. I just showed it with that. Now I'm gonna take the partial of T with respect to QJ dot. I'm gonna use the same exact logic and, and get the fact that that's gonna just equal the sum for i equal to n, m sub i, partial of r sub i dot with respect to qj dot times r sub i dot, okay? Same thing, just now I have the partial with respect to qj dot. Next, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to, you know, I talk about this a fair amount in those other little lectures, so I'll ask that you'll peek at those in your free time, like you have a lot of that. But there's this little cancellation of dots identity or cancellation of dots concept, kind of like my back minus cab rule. This little cancellation of dots step that says the partial of r sub i dot with respect to qj dot Need to write that. Partial of r sub i dot with respect to qj dot equals the partial of r sub i with respect to qj. Called the cancellation of dots because look, I canceled the dots on the r sub i and the q sub j both. I give a, a, a somewhat informal proof on why this is. Just remember this works for a holonomic constraints. So when I, so now I take the cancellation of dots and uh, that means that I can rewrite my, I can rewrite this um, partial of T. So if I apply this here, I can rewrite this as the sum for I equal one to cap N M sub I partial of r sub i with respect to qj times dotted with ri dot, okay? Now, fourth step, almost done. And I know I had to insert some stuff and I said, trust me on it. If you watch the other little videos, which are pretty short, I think, you, I think they're about 15 minutes each, it'll show where this falls in. Okay, the fourth step, I'm gonna scroll back up for a moment. So we have the partial of t with respect to qj, or the partial of t with respect to qj dot, we did both of those. Finally, need, we need the ddt of the partial of t with respect to qj dot. So we're gonna do that now. So we get the DDT of the partial of T with respect to QJ dot. All right, so I'm gonna take the derivative inside here and I'm gonna get two terms, right? So I'm gonna get this first, I'm gonna get the sum for I equal one to little n or cap n, m sub i. So I'll first take the derivative of the first term times the second. So when I take the derivative of that, it'll be the partial of ri vector dot with respect to qj dotted with ri vector dot, okay? That was the derivative of the first, derivative of this thing times that. Then I take, then I go to the second term. Second term, I'm, I'm, for some reason I'm writing this out again, I'm not sure why. So I take the first times the derivative of the second. The derivative of the second is the derivative of ri dot, which is ri double dot. 
Okay. You know, uh, really quick aside, you might, you know, I would question the fact I took the DDT. This is another aside. Um, you can ignore this at the moment. I cover this pretty thoroughly in those little short videos, but I said that the DDT of the partial of R sub I with respect to QJ, right? That's what I was trying to do. And somehow magically, I just moved the time derivative inside. I just jumped inside. How can I do that? Well, I can do that again. This is all allowed by the concept of this variational R, this virtual R, where I assume that time is independent of my variation. So since time is independent, you know, it, it, it's not a function of the partials with respect to Qs. So I can move it inside, it's independent of that. That's the justification I can use, I use to move it in. All right, last step is note that this term equals the partial of T with respect to QJ. Let's look at this. This term right here equals the partial of T with respect to QJ. Up here is the partial of T with respect to QJ. Sum for I equal one to cap N times M sub I times the partial of RI dot with respect to QJ dotted with RI dot. That's the same. And in Lagrange's equations, we had this term minus the partial of T with respect to QJ. So that term cancels out. And then we're left with the second term, M sub I, R sub I double dot, dotted with the partial of R sub I with respect to QJ. That was the term that Lagrange was replacing from generalized, this is from D'Alembert. So this combines to tell me that my, you know, this combines to say that my Lagrange's equations are simply the DDT of the partial of T with respect to QJ dot minus the partial of T with respect to Q sub J equals cap Q sub J. So again, we subtract out this partial T with respect to QJ, that removes this part. That then leaves us with just this. This is the mass times acceleration times the partial of R with respect to QJ. And then on the right hand side, I get the generalized forces. So this is Lagrange, this is Lagrange's equations. Whew. Okay, and you know, it's, it's a subset, right? This is just considering particles. Um, I haven't gone very far, but this is, but this is the nutshell. Okay, I'm gonna stop, stop here, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, let me first take questions. Okay, I assume I'm still moving along. I'm assuming everyone's jotting down the last of these notes. So I'll pause for just another minute. We'll recap this and then I wanna jump into MATLAB. Okay, I'm gonna recap. To recap, let's go back to the top. Is that okay? Everyone good with me heading back to the top? Yeah. Okay, heading back up. So today we, we dove in both feet into analytical dynamics. 
kind of fit this middle well. And we're going to spend some, by the way, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that, on analytical dynamics. We're just getting started. We said the concepts were um, that we're moving to generalized coordinates and so not vectors, but really something that's more general, something that could be treated as just a set of scalar, scalars. We want to eliminate the constraints in the method and uh, uh, yeah, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to eliminate constraints, work in more generalized forms of coordinates, and eliminate our need to rely on vectors. So first of all, we introduced the idea of generalized coordinate. Second thought was virtual work, which we'd already seen. This is the statement of virtual work, and persistence and equilibrium, that equals zero. The advantage of vir what virtual work did for us was it got rid of the it got rid of the dependence on uh, the constraint forces. We, I took a little aside and wrote the virtual work in terms of the generalized coordinates. So I replaced the generalized coordinate here, this generalized coordinate with, uh, excuse me, I replaced the virtual displacement with the generalized coordinates here. When you put that back into virtual work, it gives you this idea of a generalized force. By the way, as a quick aside, you know, in the book, and you even had a homework, it said, uh, if you look at this partial of R sub i with respect to QJ, by definition, that partial of R sub i with respect to QJ is the Jacobian. And so when we dot two things, if I have a matrix A dotted with a matrix B, I get that by, by saying that's A transpose B. That's the process. That's the process. So in this case, I'll have an F transpose J, or this statement is the same as saying J transpose F, okay? So this generalized coordinate could also be thought of as Q. So Q is the J transpose F. And we said if these generalized coordinates are independent, which for now we're assuming, okay? I'm just gonna assume that, then these terms can independently all go to zero. So I can write for independent coordinates, J transpose F equals zero. That's a, an alternative statement of virtual work. This is a statement of virtual work. And you had a homework problem on that sometime back. That was the first step. The second step, and we did this example, and I, I probably, okay. Uh, I kind of wish I would have start left, stuck with my guns and changed it up, but I didn't. But we saw in the example, that if we do it Newton's way, we get four equations with the unknown, we would just solve. When we did it the virtual work way, we wrote it in terms of this virtual displacement. The virtual displacement is a function of these parameters. I chose x, y, but then I boiled it down to theta. Would have been cleaner if I wrote it in theta right to begin with. I don't know why I didn't do that. Uh, when I write it out though, I end up with one equation, one unknown. That's the idea. Second step, D'Alembert's principle. That extends virtual work from statics to dynamics, and he simply said, well, let's let the MA look like an inertial force, make it negative move to the left-hand side, and that gave us this equation here, the generalized principle of D'Alembert, or if we write it in terms of generalized coordinates, it gave us this equation. So the sum of Fi dotted with the partial of R with respect to QJ minus M sub I, R sub I double dot, partial of R with respect to QJ. Then I said, hang on, and that was, that was the second thing, method generalized principle of D'Alembert. The problem is it's still in terms of vectors, okay? I still have to write out my acceleration explicitly, and I've got to write these things out in terms of forces and vectors. So Lagrange came along, and Lagrange's addition or extension of this is really the one that people like. He first said, well, rather than dealing with forces, let's deal with generalized forces. So we rewrite the force in this way. Now, practically speaking, typically we have to go through the step of writing the forces and dotting it with these things. So it takes a little bit of work. I'll show you a shortened way to do that. But this job pretty much remains. And here's the part I said, Kevin, hang on to your hat. He said, well, hey, look, this term is simply, I can write this thing, and this is really exciting to me. I'm excited here. He said, this thing I can write in terms of uh, kinetic energy. I can write this thing in terms of kinetic energy. And he did, he wrote it purely in terms of kinetic energy. And we didn't get a, we didn't do a derivation, but we did show below that those two things are equivalent. Once you have that, you can write Lagrange's equations here. And this is what everyone knows and loves. This is the 
99% of all problems solved with analytical dynamics are solved with this right here. That's what we did. Okay, so that's a recap. So we'll pick up with this face-to-face -face on Thursday. We'll look at this more. We'll review these. We'll work a bunch of problems, and uh, that'll be good. Okay, comments on that? Going once, twice.